Everybody have a good kickoff to the 4th of July week. I had a good kickoff. Not the kind that you probably celebrate, though. Uh, work's been pretty busy this week. I'm going to get these lights on here so you can see me. Um, it's been an interesting week. Who here is going through some stuff? Wow, man, a lot of people. I love it. Me too. I'm going through some stuff. Uh, but there's an outlet for my stuff. I get to do fun things to people that don't make proper decisions. We'll just leave it at that. I got to partake on Friday. If you were in town and saw a litany of police cars chasing a pickup truck, I was involved in that. I was behind the group in my little black undercover Nissan Murano that couldn't keep up with anything. So uh, we went all the way to Cordish Junction and it got, uh, it got pretty Western as I call it in Cordish Junction, but we got the problem taken care of. So that was a good thing. So it was good stuff. Um, and we keep, We'll keep that gentleman in our prayers. That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, and we pray for him, and we hope that he has a good recovery. And um, you know what? This might be his chance to come to Jesus. Amen. And that's, that's all we can hope for. He's not gone yet, so he's got a chance. Uh, I want to tell you a couple of quick stories to start this out. And I'm going to kind of be all over the map today. But I want to do my disclaimer this morning because... Uh, I might need to on this one. I'm out of the box when I come up here. I'm really going to be out of the box today. So if you have questions as to what I'm talking about, come and see me afterwards. Uh, it's all my fault because I didn't clear anything with Bill, Donna, or the leadership team before I decided what I was going to talk about. So it could be interesting. <laughs> so stand by. Um, Steve Shambeck shared with me a story back on Father's Day that I thought was pretty awesome to the point where I'm actually kind of glad I gave Ty first shot at it to talk about. He didn't. So I get to talk about it because I'm really fired up to share it with you. I think it's a pretty cool story. Uh, you might need some Kleenex after this, but it's a, it's a really cool story. So Steve's dad passed away. Steve Shambeck's dad passed away a month or so ago, two months, three months-ish? Yeah. Valentine's Day. Valentine's Day. Passed away. So Steve got... Of course, some of his personal belongings, one which is a watch that hasn't worked in many years, correct? This watch hasn't worked in years. Kind of a nice watch. I'm a watch guy. I have an expensive watch. Uh, I love watches. But on Father's Day, Steve got me outside. I was doing something, and the watch that he got from his dad that hasn't worked in years worked Father's Day. Started working during the, during the sermon, right? Started working during the sermon, and then Monday it stopped again. So you tell me that's, that's not a coincidence. That's cool stuff. I like those kind of stories. They, uh, and thank you, Steve, for sharing that with me. And I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot today, but I thought everybody here should know that. Uh, I'm not sure who this is for today, but I got this word. Uh, let's see. I got this word probably three, four days ago to share this with you. And then it got solidified because Joe over here shared something with me yesterday. And he sends me the coolest videos of things that, uh, that are just miraculous. And he shared a, a short video, I think it was a video, right? Was it a little video? I can't remember if it was a video or not, sorry, uh, about fear. So who here is going through some type of fear right now? Is anybody here going through some fear? Yeah, okay, cool, I'm not the only one. <laughs> Trust me, I, I go through a little bit of fear and Friday could have been one of those days, but I know I'm covered 110%. Yeah. And you take that and, it would take me a long time to teach you how I deal with it, but you turn that fear into motivation, and you will never, you'll never fear again. And who here knows how many times fear is in the Bible? 365. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. 365 times fear is mentioned in the Bible. So I had this picture. I have a picture, and you can look this up. It's a woman in the ocean swimming with a very large great white shark. And it's out of Hawaii, and the woman that's swimming with the shark is in a wetsuit and, and a, you know, a mask and fins, and she's a marine biologist, and she's swimming with this great white shark without a cage. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing picture. And if you go home, Google a uh, woman swimming with a great white shark, she's one of the first ones that'll pop up. And this shark is 20 feet long, and it weighs two tons. And she's swimming alongside of it, touching it on the face. Wow. Does she have fear? Absolutely not. She has no fear. She's a marine biologist. How many people here know, how many people here have been in the ocean and been around a shark without being in a cage? It's horrible, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's, I didn't have the choice. I don't know if you did, Joe, but I didn't have the choice when it happened, but mine is nowhere near what this woman went through. But she's swimming alongside the shark, and here's, 
here's the situation with a shark. A two-ton animal that can kill you in the blink of an eye has the brain that is exactly 1.2 ounces big. That's the size of my fist. The average human brain is 48 ounces. Okay, it's a little big. Depending on what human you are, you, your brain might be a little smaller. But most humans are 48 ounces, right? That's a big brain, correct? Okay, we're smarter than the shark. The shark doesn't know what you are swimming in the water. And I don't know if you were bumped by a shark. Yeah, so with a, what the deal with bumping by a shark is, the shark doesn't know what you are because you have arms and legs and fingers and a weird looking head. And a shark is after a turtle or a seal most of the time. So if it bumps you, it doesn't know what you are. And it's trying to figure out, okay, is this food, is this something I need to be afraid of? Or what am I going to do with this? The shark doesn't know yet. And this woman in the picture is dwarfed by this 20-foot, two-ton shark. She probably weighs 140 pounds, maybe 125 pounds, somewhere in that range. The shark can take her life in a second, but it doesn't know what she is. And it, it doesn't necessarily fear her. It just doesn't know what she is. So what marine biologists say to do, and I hope you're never in this boat, is it says to punch a shark in the nose scratch an eye or grab it by the gills and then let go. That shark will flee from you and it will not come back to you because you have injured it in a very minute way, but it did not know what you were and it's gone. So imagine that, a two ton animal that is nothing but a swimming and eating machine and you make it go away. It's no different than what we deal with every day here. It's no different than whatever fear you have now. Trust me, I don't like being in the ocean where you can't see the horizon and you're kicked out of a boat or a helicopter and you're told to hang out for a while and, and especially at night, that's not fun. And I don't know what your situation was, Joe, but I'm sure it was similar. Exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a prey drive animal. So if you splash in the water and try to swim, you're making it worse. So just enjoy the experience while you're out there. Or try to. Try to do that. We, ha we have Christians have to get into the mindset to have complete control over evil and over Satan and over our own fear. 99% of the time, if you're like me, I'll make my situation 10 times worse than it really needs to be. And, and I, I, I excel. And I tell my boss this, and he looks at me like I'm completely crazy. The more pressure and stress you dump on me, the better I'm going to operate out there, the better I'm going to do. If you dump 10, 15 cases on me, which I have now, I'm just going to operate better. I'm going to get to work, and I'm going to go. And I get that from my dad, which necessarily isn't necessarily the greatest thing when you're in a marriage, because that doesn't work all the time. Ladies, your husbands that are workaholics, uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about, and vice versa. Wives that have husbands, you know the deal. If you're a workaholic, that can get in the way sometimes. But I excel in that, and just because I've been forced to, so it's just how I do. I do a little bit better. There's Christians out there due to whatever reason it is, and I don't know if it's anybody in this room or not, and I'm not talking about anybody in this room. They look at Satan as being this powerful entity that is somewhat on an equal playing field with God the Father, because we think Satan is this powerful thing, and he can do things to us, and at times he can, but Satan is not on the same playing field as the Father. There's no way. You can't even measure how far above Satan the Father is. Our Father can kill Satan with a simple glance and be done and gone, but there's a purpose he's still here roaming the earth looking for victims. He's here. There's a reason for it. We may not understand it, and I love that verse. Lean not, on your, uh, lean not on your own understanding, but on the understanding from above, and then God will make your path peaceful. That's very, very true, and I got to share that scripture this weekend with a very close, two very close friends of mine who lost their son in a very bad traffic accident a couple weeks ago. And they said goodbye to him, 21-year-old. And the first thing I think of as a leader is, okay, did he have Jesus? And now it's, of course, too late for me to do anything about it, but I, she shared with me a bunch of pictures. Mom shared with me a bunch of pictures of him, and in one of the pictures, he's got a cross on, and it's outside of his shirt, and he's proudly displaying it, and then yesterday, I got to hear a bunch of 19, was it yesterday? Yes, yesterday, a bunch of 19, 20-somethings, all his friends, get up on stage in front of over a 1,000 people wow. and talk about this young guy and what an amazing person he was and what a godly man he was and he listened to Christian music he accepted the Lord and 
the mystery of the whole thing is, what was his job down here? Why was he taken home so early? I can't wait to find that out. My sister, my younger of my two sisters, I'm the oldest of two sisters, of three kids. I have two sisters. One, um, we're not on camera, right, Chuck? <laughs> this isn't going out anywhere. So one of my sisters needs to be delivered. She really does. And one is, is OK. My younger of the two sisters is a lot like me. She had a baby uh, with her husband, Steve. His name is Steve, too. And his name, they named my nephew Jack after my dad. And Jack only lived for 72 hours, and then he died. And my sister, of course, like any mom, would have a complete meltdown, reckless time dealing with that. And she did. But I got on the phone with her, and I said, hey, listen, you got to look at it this way. And this is keeping your eyes above. And don't take me wrong. I'm not the perfect dude to, that always keeps his eyes above. Trust me. I said, keep your eyes above on heaven. Don't lean on your own understanding because God had a purpose for that little guy to come down here and spend 72 hours. And how ironic is that? He spent three days. Yeah. Okay, what is significant about three days? Yeah. Right? We all know that. Yeah. That little dude spent three days on this planet and then went back home. I cannot wait to meet him because I'll meet him again. And I can't wait to hear the story. Hey, what was your mission, man? What was your mission? Why did you only come here for 72 hours? He probably thought, man, I'm not getting involved with this family. But he, he had a mission, right? And that's how we got to look at things. I'm, I'm, I'm just as good as the next guy at looking at a bad situation. And I'll think of all the bad things. I can be a... Uh, I can be a Timothy sometime, or a Thomas, rather. Thomas, Downing. Downing Thomas, I'll go, man, let's just go get it over with. Let's go get tortured and killed, and then let's get on with it. I can be that guy sometimes. Uh, Monday, I have the, uh, Monday, I'll be in Kingman at DOC, at the Department of Corrections, and I have an interview to do with a pretty tough dude there. And I've been praying about it for two weeks, and I haven't got any message. And I, what I should have done was come to Donna and the rest of the prayer team and said, hey, I need my path guided. I need to know what I have to do. Because what I want to do is I want to start right in with my job on this gentleman. But that's not what I'm being told. So I found out yesterday I'm going to go there. And I get to bring my boss with me, because I don't think he's saved. And I'm going to go completely outside the box. And we're going to start talking about, hey, man, what's your faith? Because what do you think he's doing every day? It's a violent, violent world in there. And now he knows there's a detective coming to talk to him tomorrow and going to spend some time with him. So he's already trying to figure out, OK, what am I going to say to this dude? Why is he coming to see me? And I want to take the carpet right out from underneath him. And we're going to, we're going to talk about something that he does not expect me to talk to him about at all. So we'll start it out that way, and we'll see how it goes. So next time I'm up here, I'll give you the report of that on how it turns out. So I'm pretty excited for it. OK, bear with me while I find my place in my notes here. How many people, uh, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. How many people got into this this week? How many people cracked this open? OK, we got, we got a few. We got six or seven. How many people read a chapter? Nice, OK. This is going to go a different direction. Now I got to come up with how I'm going to deal with this, because I didn't think I'd get too many hands raised. So that's good. I'm glad you're in it. I'm glad you're reading it. What does that do when we're in it? Has anybody here ever tried to go through something serious without being close to God? Have you tried to get through something serious without being in the Word? It's a whole other outcome, isn't it? I, I can tell you all the time. If I get deep into my job about Tuesday, Wednesday, and I'm not in that, I'm, I'm not navigating where I should be. Amen. I can't get my job done. So it's, it's very, very, very important. It's how you grow as a Christian by getting in the Word. It's one of the things we need to do. I'm going to start prepping a story I'm going to tell you that moved me this week that I saw. And maybe some of you have seen it. And if you haven't seen it, I'm going to give you the address to look it up on YouTube. Is it legal for us to read our Bibles? It's legal in this country, right? So far. Right, so far. That's a good one. So far it is. There's going to come a day when it's probably not. Is it legal for you to own a Bible? Yeah, in this country. How long did it take you to drive here today? Who lives the farthest out? Somebody lives in Rimrock, I think. That's pretty far. That's good. Yep, Wayne, yeah. There, we had a few Rimrock people here. So that's what, 30 minutes, 40 minutes-ish, depending on traffic and where you live and how deep you live in Rimrock. I drive maybe seven minutes. I'm pretty close. Did you have to stop at any checkpoints along the way? 
Did you ever have to stop at a military checkpoint? Has anybody here stopped at a military checkpoint, a legit one in a combat zone? Yeah, a few of us. I've stopped at a checkpoint um, in Macedonia, and it was my very first one ever. And I, I worked in a foreign country, and I had some vacation days, so I went to Bulgaria. And on my way back to Bulgaria, I had to cut through Macedonia. I had to go through Macedonia north to get back to where I was living in Kosovo. And each country has a checkpoint. And they're, they don't play games. So I remember I took a taxi from Sofia, Bulgaria, and I'm going north. And we're getting close to Macedonia. And it's not a very long drive. And there wasn't any war going on at the time. It's, this is peacetime. And the taxi cab driver in broken English told me, hey, I got to drop you off here. You got about a half mile to walk because I'm not going anywhere near the border of Macedonia. And I said, OK, no worries. They just don't like each other. So the countries don't like each other. So I get out of my truck, and it's in the winter, or I get out of the cab, and it's in the wintertime, and I have a backpack on, and I've got three or four days' worth of clothes in there, and i just been on vacation for a weekend. And, and, it, and if you get the chance to go to Bulgaria, it's an amazing country. The architecture is breathtaking. So I get, here I come into the mountains, into the Balkan mountains, and it's like sheer cliff drop-offs, and I'm coming up to a checkpoint. And you would think a checkpoint's this busy checkpoint. No, it's not a busy checkpoint. It's just like out of a movie. There's this little shack that you just have enough room to get in and stay out of the weather. And I'm coming up to the checkpoint. It's a one, the road goes to one lane road. No cars there, no other people there, just me, one American guy. I'm walking up, and a guy steps out of that shack, and he has an AK-47 and this big ballistic vest, and he's got the, your typical uh, Russian type. It's all communist, former communist country there. So they got the thick wool coat on, and he's just looking at me as I'm walking up toward him. And I'm like, well, this is one way to go. Because <laughs> I just didn't know. And I, I had taken my passport out of my pocket before he saw me, because you don't want to, you don't want to dig your hands in your pockets. Right. So I got my passport out. I hand it to him. We don't talk, because he doesn't speak English, and I don't speak Macedonian. And he looks at the picture. He looks at me, and he just shuts the passport, and he hands it back to me, and he just nods to go. So I go. And he doesn't even open the gate. The gate's like this tubular concrete thing that could stop a tank. And I duck under it, and I walk into Macedonia. And I got to walk about a mile before I can get to a town with a taxi, and then it takes me further. So it can be a little unnerving. I've also been in some checkpoints where you go around the corner, and there's a tank there. And the tank is pointing the gun down the road. And I'm like, wow, I'd really like to see somebody try to run that checkpoint, or what would happen. It's kind of interesting. Because you know there's always one that's got to push it. But I have a point to that story. Has anybody seen the pastor on YouTube that goes to China? And he teaches, uh, he's teaching, I think his first name's Wayne, and he teaches this group of Chinese people how to be leaders in the Christian church. And it is so moving. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what he said and, um, and how, how he went through this process. So he's an American, and he goes to China, and he goes to the Hunan province. Am I pronouncing that right? I always want to say Hunan, Hunan. Anyway. He goes there, and he gets a hotel outside the city. And the hotel room's about 700 square feet. And he has 22 people, 22 Chinese Christians, coming to the hotel room for him to teach them. So they have to go up the, first they ride on a train for 13 hours to get to him. That's why I asked who drove the farthest today. So these folks drive 13 hours to get to this hotel room to meet Wayne to learn some things in the New Testament. So they have to go up the elevator in twos. They can't all go up you know, five at a time or 10 at a time. Why? Because they can't. In China, owning a Bible is illegal. In China, Christianity is illegal. So they go up the elevator in twos. Now picture a hotel here. If you've ever been to a really nice hotel, like a five-star hotel, and you had 10 people cram into one of those elevators, they would throw up a red flag, right? They would throw up a red flag in this country. Well, in that country, you're going to prison if they find out why. So they go up in twos. They get to the room, wood floors. I think there's only two or three chairs. It's China, OK? If those of you that have been in a deep third world country know your <laughs> rooms come pretty sparse. I've been to Egypt, and it's like, whoa. It's like one chair, a TV that doesn't work, and a bathroom, and one towel. That's it, and a bed. That, but that's it. It's sparse. So they get up there. They all make it. They get up there, and it sounds like some kind of mission that they're on. And they are on a mission. But they get into the room, and Wayne has 17 Bibles. He doesn't have enough for everybody, so he starts passing out Bibles. So some people don't have Bibles, and he notices a woman in the crowd give her Bible to somebody else. And he says, hey, turn to 1 Peter. 
and she gives her Bible to somebody else. So they go through the lesson in 1 Peter, and then during a break, he gets with her, and he says, hey, I noticed that you, I think Wayne speaks Chinese. He says, hey, I noticed you gave your Bible away. And she says, oh, yeah, I, I know 1 Peter. I memorized the whole chapter. And he goes, wow. He goes, how did you do that? How did you, this is China, how did you, how did you memorize the whole chapter of Peter? And she says, in prison. I, I went to prison for three years because of my faith. And I memorized it in prison. So then he says, well, if you're in prison, there's no Bibles in prison, how did you do it? She said, people would smuggle in scripture on tiny little pieces of paper. And they would take them into the cell. And this motivates me, because I need this wake up call. They memorize that scripture, and then they get rid of it. And he says, well, what if they find you in possession of the paper? And she says, well, they take it from you, and it could go anyway. It could, they could do anything to you, but that's why you memorize fast. I memorized, um, I, have a, I don't have an, I have a chapter memorized, but it took me a long time to memorize that chapter. It took me probably six or seven weeks to get it down right in the, in the verses, or the, uh, the type of Bible. I can't think of the name I'm trying to think of. In that specific Bible, I wanted to memorize it. So she memorizes many, many, many chapters because they don't have Bibles there. So I found that to be extremely motivating because you look at churches here today and it's a completely different thing. And I'm not saying this church, okay? I'm not saying that. But you, you, you look at churches and it's a completely, a completely different attitude. And I'll get to that. So one of the things she tells Wayne is, hey, they can take my Bible verse. They can take my Bible. They can imprison me. They can't take what's in my heart. And man, what a powerful lady. I would love to have them come here. Um, so anyway, this teaching goes on. This teaching goes on. It's going to be one of those days with technology with me. Uh, the pastor spent three days there. Wayne spent three days in China. And then he asked them, hey, I'm getting ready to leave. What can I, what can I pray for you guys for? And they said, hey, we want to be like... Christian churches in America. And what do you think he says? Anybody have an idea? He says, no, I will not pray for you for that. And they look at him like, whoa, man, what's up with that? Why won't you pray that we become like you? And he said, here's why I won't pray for you to be like us is because people would never ride 13 hours on a train. If it's more than an hour, they probably won't show up. If they have to sit on a wood floor, they're never coming back. If they can't sit on a padded chair in the air conditioning, they're not going to come back. They're just not going to do it. They don't have the fire to do that. And here they are riding 13 hours on a train, sitting on a wood floor, and the teaching went on from 8 a.m. in the morning till 5 at night. That's nine hours on a wood floor, just getting trained in how to be a better and more effective Christian. That, that hit me because who am I? I need a lot of work. I don't know if I, it, it, I've been in bad stuff before, but I don't know that my motivation would carry me that far. Go ahead, Joe. He had asked uh, what would happen to him if he was arrested. Yeah. If they were caught reading out of the Bible. And they said, oh, you'll be deported. And he said, well, what would happen to you? And the lady said, Three years of prison just for being in possession of a Bible. Can you imagine? That's, in, that's just crazy to me. But there's people there doing it, and they do it every single day. And those people are warriors for Christ. That is just amazing to me that they take the chance. Imagine them coming in this door right now and taking us all out of here and throwing us in prison. It's, your jobs are gone. Your family might not be around when you get out. I've got a little daughter. It'd be three years before I see her again. I don't know that I could handle that. That would be tough. But these guys are over there risking it. And I think, okay, what did I risk? Mm -hmm. yeah. Not that you have to, but what, would I, what did I risk? I got to tell you, I came here yesterday to clean the church because I didn't have time this week because I, I have been extremely busy. And somebody donated a floor cleaning machine, and I'm sorry, but I just hadn't looked in that closet very good, and I got so excited to see this floor cleaning machine, and I loaded that thing up. And it did okay, but something so little like that that me 
man, it just got me on fire. And whoever donated that, thank you, because it made my job so much easier. And I use, I don't know if you guys use it back there, but I can tell you right now, it works awesome. I stayed out here for like an hour just cleaning spots yesterday, and it, it was kind of fun to me. But I mean, it's, it's weird, but it's, it was fun for me to do that. Hebrews 13.3, and I don't know that I have all the scriptures, Wayne, so don't kill yourself trying to put them up here because I'm going to be going fast. Don't forget those who are in prison. Remember them as though you are in prison with them. We have Christian brothers and sisters that are in prison right now. They're in China and in other countries. Pray with them and act like you're in prison with them. Don't forget those that are suffering. There's people in this room that are suffering right now. I know you're suffering. We're going to pray for you, and we're going to be with you during your suffering. There's no reason for you to do it alone. Don't forget that. I'm going to touch real quick on why I, what I started a few weeks ago, and some of you might cringe at that. And for those of you that weren't here, we talked about the Ten Commandments, and I told you it's going to kind of be all over the map today, so bear with me. Um, we have the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament, right? Do we know... Uh, some of you already know the answer. If you know, shout it out. How many commandments are in the New Testament? No takers? How many? Lots. lots. Yeah, there's lots. There's lots. And there's people that, I'll, I'll be honest, I was one of them three months ago. I, I would have never said what commandments. If somebody would have got me on the street and said, hey, how many commandments are in the New Testament? I would have said, uh, I don't know. I would have been one of those guys on YouTube that looked like a knucklehead that didn't know. And I'm not saying you're a knucklehead that you don't know. I am. 1,050, 1,050 commandments from Jesus Christ. And if you don't believe me, Google it. Please prove it. Please look at it and read all the red in the Bible. That's Jesus' commandments. So I'm going to touch a few of those and give you some examples of what I go through because I love to use myself as an example. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Wayne's on it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. There's a couple of key words in there. The word all. With all of your heart, trust in him. Lean on him. Does it say part-time? Does it say only when you're going through trials? Does it say only on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays? No. It's all the time in everything. He will direct your paths. Does it say Monday, Wednesday, Friday he'll direct them, or only when you're talking to him, or only when you have a relationship with him? No, it says he will, will, period. Key word, will. He will direct your paths. Trust me, I need my paths directed every single day at work. Friday, I needed my paths directed because it was out of control, crazy, and he did it, and it, it, everything worked out fine. How many people have a bulletin in front of them? Okay, I got to apologize first. I should have said this earlier, and I meant to. So some of you, there's five of you here that have the guts of the bulletin. You actually have stuff inside the bulletin. Everybody else has a blank sheet of paper. My, somebody, yeah, so the notes, the notes are a no-go in most of the bulletins. Here's why, because my copier ran on a toner, and it would only print them in black and white, and that wasn't good enough for me. So I wanted them in color. So, sorry about that. I got toner. Those things are expensive. If you've had to buy toner for your copier, it's not cheap. It's expensive. Um, what's on the cover of the bulletin? Fence. What's on the fence? There's a dude riding the fence. Yep. Are we supposed to ride the fence? No. Absolutely not. We're not supposed to ride the fence. There's a lot of people riding the fence. Get off the fence now more than ever. You guys all know what's going on, right, in the world today? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Can I interrupt you just for a few minutes? I'm very aware of a lot. Probably not near all. I cannot speak politically to my kids and my stuff if I am in trouble. This has been a long time. He can't do anything about it, therefore it's not important to him because he can't let it stop. Can we have a way or where do we go to find out who's doing what, how it's being done? 
Yeah, and I can tell you where to go. So you can go to your congressman or congresswoman and call them nonstop, repeatedly, email them, write them letters. I would say write letters. I'll get with you afterwards. Let me get with you after we're done, and I'll send you in the right direction. Uh -huh. I'll tell you where to go. I'll tell you how to do that as soon as I finish up. I'm happy to help you with that. You bet. You're welcome. How many people enjoy getting out of their comfort zone here? Awesome. Courtney, you like getting out of your comfort zone? Oh, good. I'm out of my comfort zone most of the time by force, confrontation-wise. I'll get into physical comfort zones here in a minute, but confrontation-wise, I used to, I couldn't stand confrontation, but now over years and decades of being in confrontation, some violent confrontation, now I, it doesn't bother me. I, I actually prefer, because I know where I stand. I know where I stand with a said specific human being. It's either going to be very violent or it's going to be very peaceful. Sometimes, and I keep bringing up Friday, but Friday was extremely violent, but that's okay. It, it is what it is. Those shots were called, and, and we're good. So it just is what it is. It's just a thing, and that's how you got to look at it. It's just a thing. you got to get through it. Get through it from point A to point B the, the most graceful way you know how. I owe you all an apology because I wasn't here last week to deal with the problem, and that's my job. I deal with those problems. How it works is, is I have a specific job here. Well, one of them, besides cleaning, one of the jobs is making sure everybody stays safe here and an active shooter doesn't come through the door. So that's already taken care of. But last week's problem was a problem, but I wasn't here and I had a conflict with taking care of my little daughter. So, and I had to go get her at like 9.40, 9.45, all the way in Rimrock. So I didn't have time to get back here. Um, but I apologize that I wasn't here for that. But that could be a good thing too because I am a really cruddy negotiator. I, when I'm on a call and the SWAT team's out there, like they were Friday in Cordis with me, and I got to let the negotiators do their job, it just, I would rather be laying on pins and needles with no shirt on. I, it, I know we have to do that, but I, I'm not a negotiator, nor will I probably ever be. I'm a negotiator for Christ. And we have some good people on that team, and they're like, listen, here's the deal. After 15 minutes, we cannot guarantee your safety anymore. And that guy I love. But we have some guys that are like, you know what, this is overtime, and if we got to go 10 hours, we'll go 10 hours. But we're on the side of the highway at noon with very heavy vests on, full of gear, and there's no shade, and it's hot, and we're dealing with a vehicle that's full of gas, gas like CS gas that stops you from breathing. And it's you're, I'm breathing it, and... It's just a very uncomfortable, out of your comfort zone kind of thing. My, the worst I've ever been in my, out of my comfort zone was I was wet, soaking wet through my clothes, muddy, hungry, and it was in the wintertime, it was cold, and I had about a half an inch or a quarter inch of mud all over my body, and I was that way for about a week. And I was going through a course that was designed to make you uncomfortable because that's the true person that comes out. And, and I like to say, when I was younger and I dated, I would take a girlfriend camping in the rain. Because you would know what you're getting into when you have somebody that's wet and cold on a camping trip, right? You know that true person, right? If I said, let's go camping, Shirley, in the rain, you'd be like, you're crazy. No, I'm not going, right? <laughs> you'd go? All right, good, good. So anyway, when I'm in this situation and I'm wet, cold, and muddy for a week and I haven't eaten good food, I'm eating a plastic garbage, and I'm sitting there and it's pouring rain on me and I'm getting instructions on a very stressful navigation thing and I got to find my way. And for some reason, I look over and I'm not in this alone. I have a few other buddies of mine that are in it, and one of them is just standing there with this huge smile on his face. And he's in the same boat as me. And I look at him, and he's smiling back at me, and he just does one of those, and that made it all better. Yeah. I could go another three weeks just because of that guy who never said a word to me, but just looked at me and smiled. And it made it OK. And you guys, you guys are like that. We're like that for each other. If we're going through tough times, we need to be like that for each other. I got a huge motivation dump this morning, and it was from Jim. Yeah. And I walk up to him, and I'm like, hey, man, how you doing? And he goes, I'm doing wonderful. <laughs> yeah. And he's just got this glow on his face. Yes, and I'm thinking, 
All the crud I went through last week, that just purged completely out of my head. And, he's, and I said, well, boy, I better not get up there and screw it up then, because you're here today. <laughs> and he just, nothing but positive stuff coming out of him. That's right. And it's so motivating, and I just want to let you know that, that the effort that it takes you guys to get here is not, it doesn't go unnoticed. And it's, it's, it's motivation. You don't know that you're motivating people, but you are motivating people. That's right. So keep doing it. Luke 6.36, be merciful just as your father is merciful. I got to remember this. I didn't want to be merciful. I'm using Friday as an example. I didn't want to be merciful Friday. This guy finally gave up after getting gassed out of his truck after 15 minutes of breathing this garbage in an eye. He set the record. I've never seen anybody take it that long. Then he met our canine, or he met a canine, canine being a dog. And the dog got to bite him because he wasn't doing what he was supposed to do. So he didn't. was I enjoying that? Not really, because this guy's making bad decisions because he's got some mental problems going on. No, I didn't want to see him get hurt, but we have to be merciful to him, and we were. And we patched him up, we patched up his, he did some things to himself with a knife, he tried to take his own life while he was in the truck, it got very ugly, and we got a helicopter landed in the highway for him, we loaded him up on that helicopter, and we, our job at that point is to save his life. So we have to be merciful. And I thank God my father's merciful to me because I've done some really stupid things in my past. And thank God he's merciful. Hallelujah. Luke 641. Why? I love this verse. I'm going to read it probably, let's see, I'm going to read it out of context here for just a second. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not perceive the log in your own eye? Man, have I been in this boat. I've had some redwood tree logs in my eyeballs a few times. People judge me, and I love to, I shouldn't say confront, but I love to kind of see why. Okay, why do you treat me that way? And we used to have uh, somebody that went to this church many years ago. She was a tough character. She was super tough, and we didn't get along. And we're leaders in this church. How stupid is that? How immature is that? We got to get along. And now we do. You don't know, Bill said it perfect this morning, we don't know what each other's going through, okay? Got to take that into consideration. I don't know what this guy's going through Monday morning when I see him. I don't know what his weekend's gonna be like. I, I can pretty much tell you it's not gonna, it probably isn't gonna be enjoyable. Whatever it is he's seeing in there right now, today. You know, what's, he, what's his mood gonna be like when I show up tomorrow morning? I have to take that into consideration. Okay, I'm gonna go a little quick here. Wayne, you don't have these, so don't worry about putting them up. Matthew 7, 1 through 3, judge not. Are we doing that? Are we not judging people? That's tough to do, right? That's pretty tough to do. I'm dealing with a couple people that go to this church. They're not here right now, so don't worry. But I have to deal with them. And, and I, I appreciate what Bill said this morning. Hey, I'm dealing with them, and he got me back there. And every now and again, Bill has to pull out the Bill Voss 2x4 and hit me in the back of the head with it. And I deserve it. Because I'm going to deal with it a specific way. And if Bill comes to me with a problem, then that means uh, it's my turn. I have to deal with that problem at that point. So I'm dealing with somebody else, or will be, and I'm going to do it in a godly way. And I have to. I can't judge them. Matthew 7, 6, I love this one. Do not cast pearl to swine. I will go above and beyond for somebody, and I have in the past, and I still am, and I still will. But there comes a point where... You have got to stop casting pearl to swine. Don't be afraid to do that. We're commanded to do that. Don't cast pearls to swine. What do I mean by that? I'll give people a chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. I will do all I can for you. I will buy your gas for your car. I will buy you groceries. You can throw it in my face. You can shove it down my throat. You can treat me nasty. I will buy your gas again. I will buy your groceries again, and I will continue to do so. Right about at the 90-day mark, I'm going to start getting tired, and I have, and I took care of somebody big time once, and it got thrown in my face pretty bad, and I'm like, okay, done. Cut, cut it off right there, and I got a text message about four days later because I bumped into her, and I didn't say much, and the help stopped, and I left. And I got a text on my phone, and the text said, what's wrong with you? Question mark. And I just texted back, you're nasty. And I didn't get a text for about a day. 
and I got another nasty text, and then I'm done, blocked, blocked her. And she saw me in town and said, what's up? And I said, here's the deal. I've done this for you, and I want nothing in return. I don't need a pat on the back. I don't need a thank you, and nor will you ever, anyone in here, ever have to thank me for doing anything. This is my service. This is what I do, and I don't want to thank you. And I might have sinned when I said this. So if those of you, if you can come and talk to me afterwards, I, I totally take responsibility. But I said, you know what? You're a very, very attractive woman. But all outward beauty is negated by the way you treat people and by your heart, which is stone cold. It negates all your outward beauty. And that hit her. And I haven't talked to her since then, and that's been about a year. So hopefully I wasn't sinning, but you don't have to cast pearl to swine. You've got to know when that is. And if you have a problem finding out when that is, feel free to come and talk to the leadership team, because I'm sure we've been through it. All right, moving on. Here's a big one. Matthew 7, 12, do unto others as you would have done to you. Can you imagine if the whole world did this? How awesome would this place be? It's not what goes on, though, but we are commanded to do that. Matthew 9, 37 through 38, pray for the workers, pray for the laborers. You guys that are at the food bank, you're my heroes. You guys are superheroes. It's amazing what goes on over there. Matthew 10, 16, be wise. Matthew 10, 28, fear not. Fear again, right? Matthew eleven fifteen. hear God's voice. How do you hear God's voice? Spending time in the word. Take some time throughout your day. Turn your TV off, turn your computer off, turn your cell phone off. I'm on call for homicides and murders right now. If a homicide or a murder came out, my phone would be ringing off the hook. Guess where my phone is? It's back there and it's turned off. Somebody else can deal with it for the next 45 minutes until I get free. Amen. It's just how you gotta be. Matthew 11, 28 through 30, here's something good for some of you in this room right now. Take my yoke, throw your burdens on him. It's what he's asking you to do, it's a commandment. Let him take your burden. Please, I can't tell you that enough. Luke 9, 23 through 25, deny yourself. What does this mean, deny yourself? I'll give you an example that I see every single day that I saw on the way to church today. I'm not picking on the ladies, but you know who I'm talking about. You go to the gym, how many people here go to a gym? You don't know what you're gonna get into when you go to the gym or what you're gonna see, do you? I don't go to a gym, I stay home. Oh yeah, but I Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, you gotta be careful. You got to be careful because what you wear can send a, a mixed message, okay? I, and, I, and I've said this before. I dropped my daughter off to the Christian school up on Willard, and I, I go there in business attire because it's usually on my way to work, and I see what some of the moms are wearing, and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Did you airbrush that on today? Did you paint that on your body today? You don't want to do that. You're going to send the wrong message, and men are no different. I'm not picking on the ladies. I've seen some men that I'm like, no. No, you can't wear spandex to the gym. You cannot do that. Don't put yourself on Facebook on video working out in your spandex. And I got a friend that does that, and I got to tell him every time, I don't want to see you. Don't, I don't want to see you like that. Deny yourself. Luke 12, 15, beware of covetousness. Matthew 18, 21 through 22, forgive offenders. I'm getting down on my list here. That's a tough one. That's a tough one to forgive somebody, isn't it? I, Bill's got some great testimonies. Bill gave the testimony a long time ago, and I can't remember the gentleman's name, but they had a conflict. It went on for a while. Bill broke, and Bill went to him and, and asked him, even though it wasn't Bill's fault, went to him and said, hey, man, I'm sorry. If, if, it's, if, this, is, if this whole thing is hedged on me, then I, forgive me, even though it wasn't. But Bill was just taking the high road, and, and it broke. And Bill, I remember when Bill was telling me this, he was weeping about it. But the best thing about it is when Bill said, you know what, that whole thing lifted off my shoulders, it was off my chest, and I felt the greatest peace I've ever felt in, my, in his life, and that was huge, huge. Is it easy to do? No, trust me, I'm dealing with some Hells Angels guys. Do I wanna forgive them? No, no. Do I have to? Yeah. Do I have to love them? Yes. And I can't wait for Thunder Valley Rally uh, coming in September because they have a booth. And guess who's going to go to the booth and give out hugs? Me. I'm doing it. I may not fare very well, but I'm going to go do it because they need love, right? They need to be loved. I, I'm not fearful. I don't care. I will go. Matthew 26:41. I'm almost done. Watch and pray. Do not walk in temptation. 
you, I don't need to touch base on this, but we all have temptation, right? How many people here have a PC at home, a laptop computer? All right, you can find more temptation than you need to find on that stinking piece of equipment. A cell phone, you can find all kinds of stuff on your cell phone. Be careful. If you have kids, watch your kids on a cell phone. I can't tell you enough. I deal with teenagers and their cell phones every single week, at least one. We have a nice little system there called the DP-10. We plug their phone in with mom and dad's permission, and it dumps everything in that phone, everything they've ever done in it, whether they deleted it or not, it brings it back. It's a miracle device. And the garbage we see on that from teenagers is shocking. I just got done having a counsel a mom about her 10-year-old. 10-year-old. There's people in here right now in this church that know some of the people I'm talking about. I'm not going to give names, but you know them. And their kids are doing this on, on a phone. So be careful. I tell high school kids all the time in criminal justice class, do not do dumb things on a cell phone. Do not take naked pictures of yourself. Do not send naked pictures of yourself. I'll, that's as deep as I'll go. But it gets worse. Matthew 18, 15 through 17, restore broken relationships. Am I a fan of this? No. No. But I have to do it, right? I'm commanded to do it. Is it hard to do? Heck yeah, it's hard to do. I don't want to do it. It's tough to do. But we're commanded to do it. One more. Luke 24, 49. Receive God's power. Some of you may think you're not worthy enough to receive God's power, but I'm telling you right now, you're, you're worthy enough to receive God's power. You're grafted into the vine. You're royalty, as Ty says up here. You are royalty. There's people here that they don't think that their prayers are strong enough to heal somebody. I pray back here a lot when you're all here, and I pick a person specifically on a Sunday, and I pray like crazy for them. I pray for Steve's mother-in-law to regain her sight again. And she's probably not receiving her sight at this point. So then I, I got to look at myself and go, OK, Father, why isn't my prayer being answered? I have the power to do this. I need to lay hands on her. Why? why? What's Jeff doing that is not getting this woman healed? And I, I'll go. I'll go a week like that. And I'll just keep her on my mind and pray for her. Um, I, wanna, I pray for everybody here that's going through a physical problem or whatever problem you have, a family problem. Sometimes those are even worse. I'm praying for you out there. Trust me. So you're not alone. That's the biggest thing. You have to remember that you're not alone. You're going through this with everybody else here. Okay? Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. I might have already touched on that one. There's things I don't understand. I didn't understand why we didn't get this thing fixed before we got out of the Verde Valley Friday, and we had to go all the way to Cordis. I'm like, why do we have to go all the way to Cordis, Father? I don't, I don't understand that, but there's a, there's a reason for it. I don't know what that is yet. Revelation 3, 15 and 16. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Does that sound pleasurable? Does that sound enjoyable? No. When he says, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm, that's serious. We have got to be the best Christians we can possibly be Sunday afternoon through Saturday night until we get back here again. You've got to be on your game. You've got to be on the ball. Don't, I don't want this said to me. 1 John 2, 15 through 16. I'm in my closing, just so you guys know. I know you want to get on with your Sunday. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. I've got to remind myself of this sometimes. I'm a car guy. I'll see a really nice Porsche. We, I don't know what the deal is, but lately there's been a really a lot of nice really cars going through town. I don't know what that is. Maybe just because I'm out driving around, but I'm a Porsche guy because my dad was a Porsche guy, and my dad owned Porsches, and my dad was a wealthy guy down here. And he's gone now. He's deceased, but he was a car guy. And I grew up driving around in really nice cars thanks to my dad. And I had a lot of fun in cars that I wasn't allowed to drive, so when he was gone or on vacation, I would sneak those cars out and I would go race my buddies. But uh, I'm a car guy, and I got to watch that because I can't take it with me. Titus 1.16, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. I'm talking about teachers in the Christian church here. That's what this verse is for. That's powerful. Some of the false teachers in the church were not believers at all, ever. 
Eventually, even the seemingly noble works of unbelievers will betray them. They'll be disqualified, the Bible says. They can do nothing that pleases God. They never really accepted their faith. They never really accepted Jesus Christ in the first place before they came, became leaders. I don't think we have any of those here. I can tell you right now, I, we don't, that's not going on here. We all, and we would know it because we meet once a week. Most of the time, we meet once every Friday for one hour, sometimes an hour and a half here, and we talk about everything that goes on, and we, we take care of problems. And I can tell you, I don't believe that there's anybody here that has this problem. Luke 6, four, Luke 6 46 through 49. I'm going to read it out of my Bible here. Luke, uh, Wayne, I don't know if I gave you this one. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on, a, on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and destruction was complete. That's one of my favorite analogies from Jesus because you have to be in the word. You have to have that relationship with him all the time. You've got to build your house and your foundation solid. If you don't or you leave it or you don't maintain it, it's going to crumble. Our faith is no different, and that is exactly what he's talking about. If you take on that faith and you hear that word and you're not out there doing something with it or doing something about it, you are going to face a hardship. It's just like the seed. The sower of the seed, the seed that hears the word is like seed that's cast out and grows, but then is choked out by weeds. Okay, same, same situation. Almost done. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you. I have to test myself every day. I go to work and I go out into the public and I go home at night and I've said this before, but I'm going to say it again. I reevaluate what I did during my day. Did I say something I shouldn't have said? Did I do something I shouldn't have done? I always go over that. And there's some times I got to look at myself in the mirror and go, dude, who the heck are you? You're supposed to be this Christian guy and you're supposed to be doing this and you're supposed to be an example, a double pillar in the community. But here you are dragging your knuckles and being a caveman when you should be doing the opposite. I got to put on this mask tomorrow when I go to the prison because I can't show fear. Am I going to be comfortable with locked doors behind me with no weapon? No, I'm not. I'm not, but I've been there. I've already been there. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be locked in a complete dorm with about 50 inmates and the doors close behind you and they don't open fast. It takes a while to get them open. It's bulletproof glass, and if you get into a situation in there, it's going to be a minute. So you better be okay. You better know what you're doing. So what's the most powerful thing I can bring with me is Jesus in prayer. Last one, Luke 12:40. You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect him. I'm going to fall back on my my friend's 21-year-old son who was killed in a car accident on the 101 a couple weeks ago. He was ready. But do you think that day he's driving around before the accident happened thinking, Lord, I'm ready for you to come back? Do we do that? I'm pretty sure he probably did. He had a little mission down here on earth and God took him home. He's done, he's retired now. He's with him. Hands down, I know that's where he is. Do we think in this, though? I, I got to tell you, I do now, but I used to think, man, when I'm in my career field, I'm going to be the men in my family. We kick off. We punch the time card at about 75, 76 years old, either cancer or heart, heart attack. That's what gets most of us. But I have my mom's side. They're a bunch of hardcore mutts from Bridgeport, Bridgeport Connecticut. Nothing kills them. I mean, they go on forever. My mom's going on 85, and she still walks five, six miles a day, drives a car. So she's tough. I think I have her blood. So it's good. I'm joking about my family. I love them all. But don't, don't take for granted that, hey, I'm going to be 90 when I die, and I'm going to die in my sleep peacefully. Don't think that. You don't know. Some of us look at Lisa Durker. Yeah. 
taken home quick. I would never saw that coming. Yeah. Glenn and Lisa Myers. We had another guy named Mike Baker here. That was a shock to me too, years and years and years ago. Hardcore cowboy, but boy, you ask him to do something for the church or for God, stand by. That guy's on fire. He's going to go do it. Don't take it for granted. We all wish for that retirement, but the main retirement we have to be ready for is that retirement. That's the best retirement yes. you can have. We don't know the day or the time. I'm ready. I'm ready. He can come in the next 15 minutes. I'll be happy. <laughs> but we're still here, and we have to make the best of it, and we have, each have a job to do. So don't forget that. And you're here for a reason today, and thank you for being here. And we're small, but, man, we are so powerful in this little church. And I'm proud of you guys for getting through what you got through last Sunday because I heard about it, and I heard the whole bathroom lock thing, and I'm thinking, okay, what would I do? And it's probably a good thing I wasn't here because I go for the problem immediately. It's called John Wayne Courage, which I, it has nothing to do with me. It's actually stupidity, and I'll go head first into something I should back off and think about, but I don't always think. But thank, thank God you were all here dealing with it, and you dealt with it so amazing. You gave her patience and kindness and time, and, and she did some nasty things, and she left, and that's okay. It, it got through, and I know that damages people, and I get it. Trust me, because I deal with it all the time on my, at my job, but you did, a, you did a wonderful job, and I'm, I'm so, so amazingly overwhelmed and happy that you guys did what you did with that, and top-notch job, so thank you. You got anything? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Thank you, Steve. That's perfect. Bill? Just the prayer room. Uh, if you need prayer, trust me, it works. I can tell you, go back there and get prayer. If you need prayer, it doesn't matter what your prayer is. Go get it out of you and get prayer for it, whatever you're going through. Yes, Shirley? The sound of freedom movie. Yes. Yeah. I'll talk about that. Has everybody heard about the sound of freedom movie with Jim Caviezel coming up? It's going to be hard for me to go see that because I have a little daughter and I know what I know what this is. I I don't do what he does. He's playing an HSI detective investigator, Homeland Security investigator who investigates uh, trafficking. trafficking of children. It has to do with this big network of crime period, but they'll traffic children for the sex trade. And if that doesn't work, then they'll harvest kids for their organs. It's terrible. Uh, they don't, they, they'll utilize a child in any way, shape, or form they can to make money and make a profit. It's going to be a very emotional thing. And there's a, if for those of you that don't know who Jim Caviezel is, he played Christ, he played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ. Mm -hmm. There's a really good talk show with him and another guy named Sean Ryan, and he breaks down this role that he plays, and he breaks down what he went through in The Passion of the Christ. And I promise right after this I'll be done. He talks about what he went through in The Passion of the Christ, and it was amazing. I didn't know he went through all the things he went through. Um, he was told that when he took the role, he was done in Hollywood. Hollywood does not want to profess anything about Jesus Christ or a Christian-type lifestyle. They, and they said the same thing about this movie, uh, The Sound of Freedom. If he did this movie, he was out of Hollywood again. But he, Jim, Jim is a Christian, hardcore Christian guy, and so is his wife and family. And he right away said, I'm doing it. You can have Hollywood. You can have everything. Uh, and I'll walk away. And he's a very wealthy man, but he says in the show, I will walk away from everything I have if I need to. I don't care. I'm just a guy who's doing something for Christ at the end. But carrying the cross in the, in the scene where he's carrying the cross, it actually hits him in the back of the head, and he bites through his lip and bites his tongue. And the blood coming out of him in that scene out of his mouth is real blood because he got injured. He was hypothermic uh, for days on end. Uh, he went through surgeries because he damaged his heart in the movie. Um, Say, he was hit by lightning during the crucifixion scene. It, I don't. Uh, yeah, he was whipped with cat of nine tails a few times, and you know actors get into the role and they want to see. In order to act properly, they want to feel what, what a person would really feel with that. That's crazy, but that's what he did. But his testimony is amazing. Drag, when he's going up the hill, dragging the cross, 
to be crucified, he's, he gets a word from Satan, and Satan is telling him he's dead. He is a dead man if he finishes this portion of the movie. And he continues on. It's a very powerful, uh, it's a very powerful segment in his talk with Sean Ryan. So uh, if you get a chance, watch it. And watch Wayne, too, uh, that goes to China and preaches over there. Yes, ma'am. I don't know what Wayne's last name is, but if you punch in um, pastor that goes to China, Wayne will come up. And he's wearing a white shirt. It's only about four to seven minutes long. And I believe Wayne is Chinese himself. He's American Chinese. And he's wearing a white shirt, so you'll know you're on the right, uh, you're on the right, the right movie there. So let me pray for